Have you ever taken a risk and jumped off into the unknown? Anybody? So I have a story of, of a time that I took a jump into the unknown, quite literally. Uh, in fact, this was a number of years ago. I was younger and much dumber. Um, and some friends and I went swimming in this creek. I actually was corrected after the first service. I, I'm supposed to say crick because I'm in central Pennsylvania. I refuse. Uh, <laughs> I was, we were swimming in this creek that was underneath this old railroad bridge. And someone had put this rope up to the bridge. And the water got to be about eight feet deep. And you could swing off this rope and jump into the water. And we spent most of the morning on this hot summer day just swimming and enjoying the water and having a good time. Well, one of my friends who I was with started to talk as we're just hanging out in the water about how his other group of friends, they would climb up on top of this bridge and jump off into the water. And it was just, it was so much, so much cooler than just hanging out on this rope. And, and so naturally being late teen guys, we are like, Psh, we can jump off that bridge. What are you talking about? And so we decided to, as a group, the three of us, actually four of us that were there, uh, walk up and get to the top of this bridge. And so he decides to go first to show us exactly how they jumped off this bridge whenever they did it. So he would climb up and he would shimmy his way out the edge of this I-beam that was on the side of the bridge. And once he got to the middle and could get kind of gauge where the deep water was, jump. So my next friend watches this and then does it as well. And so there's me now, both of my friends who had already jumped are up there, and I'm like, man, I gotta do this too. I can't chicken out and be, be the, the odd man out on this. So I climb up and I'm a little bit timidly shuffling my way to the middle of this bridge, and I look down and I can't see anything about the water. It's just a big muddy mess. Those two just jumped with the stream moving and all of this, there was no way I could see where the bottom was. So they're goading me on. I'm like trying to guess where the middle is. And finally, I jump off into the unknown. I need to tell you something about my two friends in order to understand what, what is about to happen in this story. So both of these guys made it to the water fine. There was no issue. My first friend is, is somewhere around five foot six, about 150 pounds. The other friend who went is much smaller. He's only five foot four. I bet he weighs 120 pounds on a good day. I don't know if you know this about me. I am neither of those things. I am quite a bit larger than both of them. And so at the time, six foot four, probably over 200 pounds, I decide I'm going to try this thing. And so I leap into the water. And apparently the amount of water it takes to slow them down is not the same amount of water it takes to slow me down. So I slam into the bottom of this creek and just destroy my legs. Luckily, nothing was broken, but I was hurt. I was limping around for a couple weeks, especially my knees and my ankles, joints were all sore, because I jumped into the unknown and had a negative result. That's kind of the way that we approach the unknown, isn't it? We assume that that is going to be the outcome. So we want to avoid the risk of taking the jump at all, because that could be the end. That could be the outcome for us, a negative, painful experience. This morning, we're actually going to be talking about taking risk, particularly talking about taking risk into the unknown. This whole month, that's what the series Risky Business is going to be all about, us learning how to take risk in connection to our relationship with God, how we can have courage with our relationship with God and take risks, particularly when it comes to living a life that's honoring to God and helping other people see what it means to have a relationship with Him. So this whole series, we're actually going to be walking through the life of Moses. We're going to be looking at all these different touchstones of his life so that we can unpack this conversation about risk and how we can begin to have courage and push aside fear to take risk for God. We live in a pretty risk-averse society, don't we? Our society is very much so about making sure we do things safely. We make sure that we are doing things that keep us from harm, that even keep us from the potential for harm. We have so many laws and rules in place in our society to help protect people even from themselves. Some of that's a good thing, obviously. Some of that's a good thing, but the safety-oriented, risk-aversion-based society really means that we're all about comfort. 
That is the life that we're actually seeking. We are trying to find comfort. And so when we avoid risk, when we chase, chase safety, it's because we all want to lean towards comfort. And that's in and of itself maybe not a bad thing, but when it becomes the end all of your life, being comfortable, then naturally it leads us to avoid risk. We don't want to even face the fear or the potential harm that could come from it. We want safety, we want comfort, and we're never going to do something intentionally that may impact that safety or comfort. See, the natural byproduct of pursuing comfort in our lives is a lack of adventure. When we only chase comfort and safety and we refuse to risk, we lose the adventure of life, and I would argue we actually lose an opportunity for abundant life. Comfort is the enemy of adventure, and oftentimes comfort can also be the enemy of a full life found in a relationship with God. Here at the church, we actually have a, a set of values, and one of our values is we value God's mission more than our comfort. We value God's mission more than our comfort. And what that means is we will choose to sacrifice our comfort for the sake of God's mission. So if that means we need to temporarily set aside something of our own ambition, our own comfort, so that people can take next steps in following Jesus, we're going to. That's one of our values. In the U.S., this is a really hard conversation. This is a tough conversation to have because so much of our lives, so much of our world is built around us trying to find that comfort, isn't it? Even those of us who temporarily willingly go into discomfort usually do so because we know at the end of the day there's going to be a greater, longer comfort, isn't there? Those of us who sacrifice and work hard, it's so that we can set aside so that we can be comfortable later. Comfort is something that is part of our DNA and our culture and our society. But a relationship with God means that we need to learn how to take, have the courage to take risks because God wants us to have abundant life in line with his mission by bringing people in a relationship with him. And the only way that we can really chase his mission fully is if we're willing to sacrifice our comfort and take a risk to do so. I think sometimes we falsely believe that comfort and security are the same thing. We think that the only way to have security is by being comfortable. But we can actually have a life of adventure, a life of risk with God in our corner and still have security. God can carry us through. We can have courage to face the unknown when we're facing risk with God. When we have a relationship with God, we can take risk. Where are those areas in your life where you struggle with taking risk? Maybe it's that struggle of not wanting to be without employment. Maybe it's that struggle of wanting to make sure you have this roof over your head. Maybe it's the struggle of wondering where the next meal is going to come. Any time that we do anything that may impact those things, we struggle. Because we don't know the outcome. It's the unknown. We don't want to risk the unknown and jump into that. Well, this month, like I said earlier, we are looking at these different touchstones in Moses' life. We're looking at all these places where M Moses is challenged to have courage and to face his fear and to listen to God and to follow what God has for him, to take risks. We're actually starting the story here today at the, right at the beginning of Exodus. In fact, we are picking up right where we left off last week. Last week, we were, in the, we were at the end of our series, Risky, or end of our series, really, this one's risky business, end of our series, really, where we looked at the life of Joseph, and we saw all of these things in Joseph's life that didn't make much sense, but he learned how to trust God in those moments, and at the end of the story, Joseph is second in command of the world superpower of the time, Egypt. So Joseph, because of his place in Egypt, has so much power and authority, and because of that, his family actually came to Egypt they live there and they prosper and they prosper and they prosper and they prosper to the point where they just grow in abundance. There are so many people that have come out of Joseph's family. They're, they're now the Hebrew people. These are the Israelites. Joseph's family has gotten ginormous. And by the time it has grown to be the size of a nation, the Pharaoh at the time forgets who Joseph even was. This is years later. 
He doesn't have this relationship with Joseph that the Pharaoh did in Genesis. And so, because of this relationship, he's, the lack of relationship, I should say, he begins to fear the Israelites. He begins to fear the Hebrew people because they are so many in number, they are outnumbering the people of Egypt. So his solution is to enslave them. So he enslaves the entire nation of Israel. They are now slaves to Egypt. And then he's, his fear goes a step further, and he makes an edict. I want every single boy born who is Hebrew to be killed. I want to try and cull this whole growth thing. I want to get rid of these numbers. So he makes this edict. The problem is, Hebrew midwives are not a big fan of killing baby boys. In fact, they see it as an affront to God to do so. Because this is the people of God, the chosen people of God. So they refuse to kill them. In fact, they're hiding the babies. They're trying to keep them as safe as they can. And once Pharaoh catches on that all this is happening, he puts out a new edict. Throw them in the Nile. Anytime you find a baby boy, that's where it needs to go. The second it's born, it should be thrown in the river. So there's actually Egyptians wandering around trying to get these babies rounded up, thrown in the river to all stunt the growth of this nation of Israel. That's where we pick up the story. In Exodus 2, verse 1, it says, Now a man from the house of Levi, Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch, and she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds at the riverbank. So this family has a baby, and they're trying to hide the boy for three months. And when it becomes obvious that there's no way to keep hiding this baby without the Egyptians coming and taking it, they take a basket, they waterproof it, put the baby in the basket, and the mother takes the basket and places it in the river. Technically, she's following the rules of, of Pharaoh, right? She threw the baby in the river. She just also gave him a little bit of an extra leg up by creating this basket so that he can float off, right? She, that mother is taking amazingly huge risk, isn't she? She has no idea what's going to happen. At three months old is usually when babies start to roll and start to move just a little bit. Who's to say the baby doesn't roll over and all of a sudden that whole basket upturns and the baby's tossed in the river? Who's to say that maybe a wave comes by and doesn't throw the baby into the river? There's also this thing known, called the Nile crocodile, the second largest crocodile in the world, known for attacking people. Guess where they live? The Nile. So there's these giant crocodiles. There's this river. There's all this unknown. And then on top of that, the Egyptians are looking for the baby. They're looking for all the babies. So what could happen if an Egyptian were to happen upon this basket floating at the bank, and they find the baby. That is actually what ends up happening. An Egyptian does find the baby. But the Egyptian that finds the baby is Pharaoh's daughter. And when she sees the baby, she immediately has a heart for that baby and chooses to keep the baby for herself. She chooses that I'm going to take this baby and she, he's going to be my son. Well, what she doesn't realize is this baby's sister is actually off in the distance, and she's been watching this whole thing, just trying to figure out what's going to happen to my brother. And when she sees Pharaoh's daughter come, she rushes up and says, hey, do you want me to find a nurse for this baby? Well, Pharaoh's daughter's like, yeah, that'd be great. You could find one amongst the Hebrew women, and they can take care of it, and I'll pay them, and, and we'll be good. So the mother of the baby actually ends up getting to raise the baby for a while, and nurse the baby, and take care of the baby, until in verse 10, when the child grew older, she, being the mother, brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the beginning of Moses' story. And this story started because the mother was willing to take a risk into the unknown to protect her child. She trusted that God would take care of the baby in a way that she wasn't going to be able to because the Egyptians were going to find the baby. And that was going to be the end. So she was willing to take the risk. So many things could have gone wrong. So many things could have gone poorly for this poor child. But instead, God orchestrates Moses' circumstances in a way that he ends up in the most powerful family in the world. Moses is given this place of privilege all because his mother was willing to have the courage to risk the unknown. 
God can give us the courage to take a risk when we can't see the outcome. When we face the unknown, when we take that risk in relationship to God, he can use that risk to transform our lives and to impact the world around us. A relationship with God can help us take that risk and not just be content in being comfortable, not just be content in safety, not just being content in a life that doesn't have adventure and doesn't have the fullness that can be found in a relationship with God. One of the most important risks that we can take is the first risk in a relationship with God, and that is a risk in choosing to follow Jesus. Matthew 13, 44, Jesus, in a very short parable, kind of encapsulates this a little bit. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and then covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and he sells everything that he has, and he buys that field. That treasure is the same as a relationship with Jesus. And that man risked everything in his life, his entire lifestyle, in order to have the opportunity to receive that treasure. What could have happened in that whole process? While he's selling everything, while he's getting rid of things, maybe someone else could have found that treasure and they could have taken it. Or maybe when he buys that field and he gets the treasure, it turns out the treasure actually is only on the surface and the rest of it's just junk. There's a little bit of risk there from our perspective before we have a relationship with Jesus, isn't there? Because it's obvious that as you jump into a relationship with Jesus, something's got to change. Your life cannot stay the same if you're going to choose to follow Jesus. And there's risk involved with that. The thing is, though, once we begin a relationship with Jesus, we understand that the risk is actually just that preliminary thing that we saw. In fact, the risk isn't there at all. In fact, we're going to find life, abundant life, and we're going to have a full, satisfying life because of a relationship with Jesus, one that we cannot experience without him. This initial risk of following Jesus is the beginning of an adventurous life. And when that life is lived for God, the way in which he wants it to be lived, it means you're going to face more risk. You're going to face more adventure. You're going to have more challenges. But the impact that it will have on your life, the incredible reward of full life, of satisfying life that comes out of a relationship with Jesus is so far worth the risk. And the amount of people who can be impacted by our relationships with Jesus. It's amazing. All because of God and our willingness to take that risk in Him. To gain a greater reward, we need to risk something. This is pretty common understanding, right? The whole stock market functions. It rises and falls based off of people's ability and willingness to take risk. Faith works a lot of the same way. We need to be willing to take risk in our faith, in our relationship with God, so that we can increase our faith, so that we can see what God wants to do through us when we're willing to push aside our comfort for the sake of God's mission, for the sake of helping people come into a relationship with Him. So where are you playing it safe in your life? Particularly in your relationship with God. Where are you letting the fear of the unknown dictate your life? What kind of risks are we even talking about here, right? Well, first off, are you willing to risk relationships? Are you willing to risk being thought of as weird or risk even an entire relationship with someone by sharing Jesus with them? Are you willing to take that risk? I know that's a big ask. And I know that's what we see from the front, right? But just like starting a relationship with Jesus where it appears to be a risk, oftentimes it's not as big of a risk as we realize. In fact, when we have a relationship with Jesus and we know who he is and we've grown in that relationship and we've seen the amazing things he can do in our lives, then that reality should overshadow what we believe to be a risk. We have this fear of rejection sometimes, don't we? We're afraid that if we put ourselves out there and we allow people to hear our story, they're gonna go, man, I don't buy it. I don't see it. And they push it aside, right? In the end, God's going to be the one that transforms people's lives, not us. But we have the opportunity to share our relationship with Jesus with other people. To let other people see the way in which God has moved in our lives so that they can see the potential for what he can do in theirs. Are you willing to risk ridicule 
Are you willing to risk relationship so that people can know who Jesus is? Are you willing to risk the way you live your life for the sake of Jesus? Are you willing to risk being picked on because you choose to stand up for certain things? Are you willing to risk persecution because you're willing to take the risk of living the life that God wants you to live it in the way he wants you to live it? We got to see an amazing story about this a few weeks ago when we did baptisms. In one of the services, one of the ladies who got baptized told her story and where she has come through this journey of her life. She has actually been asking God for courage. That has been the beginning of this conversation for her. And as she has done so, God has revealed how her life is not in line with the life that he wants for her. And that she was choosing to live outside of her design because of a relationship that she was in, where she was living with her boyfriend, and the boyfriend was actually helping support her and take care of her kids, and all of this. So there was a lot of security and a lot of comfort where she was. While she realized through this conversation with God and understanding who he is, that that's not the way that she she was supposed to be living. So she felt this conviction to leave the situation. And when she left the situation, she experienced life and joy and peace in a way that she had never experienced that before. And even more so then, God went a step further and helped provide for her new housing, provide for her some support so that she could take care of the kids and all of this. And she was standing up declaring in her baptism, this is what God has done in my life because I've chosen to live the life he wants me to live, not the life I want to live. Are you willing to sacrifice your lifestyle to live the way God wants us to. See, the risk of living a life that's in line with God's word, it carries some social implication. It automatically groups you up with some folks that really aren't that much of a Christian viewpoint at all. But it does put you in this place where now people are gonna look at you differently when you choose to stand up and live the way that God wants you to. But are you willing to sacrifice that comfort to find more abundant life in him and to show other people that abundant life. Are you ready to take that risk? Are you ready to take the risk of your resources? Are you willing to risk your time or your money if it means impacting God's kingdom? This is one I think we all struggle with quite a bit. I know for me personally, I struggle with giving my time. I struggle with being willing to set aside my time for so many things. We all have so many things competing for our time, right? We have all this busyness and all this craziness. And if you have kids, they have their own craziness that now you're also in charge of. And so it's this this big pile up of all this stuff competing for your time. And so for me, if I'm going to commit to something, I want to guarantee that it's going to work. I want to guarantee that what my time gives matters, right? The crazy thing is, and I don't know why this lesson hasn't been learned so easily for me, Every time I'm willing to commit for something that's going to impact God's kingdom, God moves in my life in a way that is just incredible, that I have never expected, and he blesses me in such an amazing way while also allowing other people to be impacted for him. This can show up in so many different ways. This doesn't show up in service projects. We actually have that one coming up that we just saw in the video this morning, this Operation Christmas Child Packing. It's a really simple thing where you can go to the the center in Shippensburg You can help pack these boxes, and it'll make an impact on some kid's life. Something simple. Are you willing to commit your time to something like that? We've got plenty of need here at Grand Point in the church. We always need help with setup and teardown in here. We always need help with the welcome team, the hub, the worship team, the cafe, all of the stuff that we need help in. We also need help in the kids' ministry. We need help with teachers. We need help with the production stuff that goes on here. There's so many things that we could commit our time to. But oftentimes, we avoid that risk to our resources because we don't know how it's going to turn out. So why would I commit to that if I don't know how it's going to pay off? Do any of you have one of these friends? I've, I've got one that never will commit to anything. It's like they're always looking for the better offer. Like, I have a friend that my group of friends will invite to almost everything that we do together. And every time we invite them, it's like, oh, hold on, I don't know what's going on, let me check it out. And then when when the time comes, he either bails or he tries to jump in when it's too late. Because of this 
fear of commitment, this fear of jumping in, because he doesn't know if something better is going to be there, he actually has now had a stretched and strained relationship with us. In fact, it's gotten to the point where now we don't even know if it's worth asking him if he wants to join us, because he's probably going to say no anyway, at least to the last second. When we risk, though, when we risk for the growth of God's kingdom to make an impact for him, we know that God can use us to change the world around us. God can use us to make an impact. But we have to have the courage to take the risk. We have to be willing to put ourselves out there into the unknown. Are you ready to be involved? Are you ready to take that risk? I don't know about you all. I don't want to be just okay being comfortable. I don't want to be okay just chasing safety. I want a life of adventure. I want a life of abundant life that comes through my relationship with Jesus. And that means I need to be willing to have the courage to take the risk and follow what God has for me in my life even when I have no clue how it's going to turn out. If we let our fear of the unknown, the things that might happen dictate the way we live our lives, then we're never really going to experience life. Especially not the abundant life that we can have in God when we take a risk for him. I want to tell you a story about a guy that I met. Um, his name is John Moxon. And John is a pretty incredible guy. We actually have a picture of him that's going to come up here. He's the guy in the middle there. He's uh, quite a bit smaller than me, as you can tell, me and my other college friend there. John was born in England um, quite a while ago. And John, as a little kid, had an experience with Jesus. And it was an incredible experience with Jesus. So much so that his entire life, all he wanted to do was share Jesus with other people. He was driven and called to minister for Jesus. The thing is, John is a small little guy with dyslexia. And so John struggled all through school. He had teachers and friends picking on him all the time, saying, you're too stupid, you can't do this. He would talk about wanting to be a, a minister and a pastor, and they're like, you can't do that, you can't even read. Well, he ended up going to ministry school, and he flunked out because he couldn't read. In fact, he told me he even now can't read. Um, the way he reads now is by looking at the shapes of words, not by the actual letters. So he can kind of guess, based off of the way a word's shaped, what it actually says. He can't read them because his brain jumbles all the letters up. Well, John failed the first time he tried to go for his ministry license. And then he failed the second time. And even the professors were saying, you are too stupid, you can't do this. You're not going to be able to pull this off. Well, he kept trying, and he took the risk. He took the risk of facing this ridicule to the point where finally he passed. And he has most of the Bible memorized because of it, because he can't read it, so he's got to memorize it to know it. So the guy's like a walking Bible. It's fantastic. But he finally passes, and then he joins a ministry called Project Evangelism. And Project Evangelism, Evangelism is kind of a, a quasi-missionary sort of um, program where they would actually go, and they would just share Jesus with people. And they did that all kinds of ways, setting up youth centers, um, helping connect with churches, helping them grow. But he joined this organization as a minister, as a pastor, and was helping serve to the point where eventually he became the head of Project Evangelism. He is now the director of Project Evangelism. And in 1969, John decided to take an amazing risk. John decided that Project Evangelism needed ministry in Northern Ireland. I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but in the 60s, 70s, 80s, Northern Ireland was not a good place to be. The Protestants and the Catholics were at war with each other. And when I say they're at war, they are putting bombs in people's cars, they're coming out in the streets armed, all over this conflict of religion and this conflict of national identity. Because there's a struggle between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and so there's this big tension, there's a lot of danger, and John chose to take the risk to jump into that, to risk his life, to risk his family for the sake of sharing Jesus with people. John has been in Northern Ireland for 50 years now. And countless people have come into an, a relationship with Jesus, all because he was willing to have the courage and trust God to take the risk and to jump into ministry there. 
if someone like John can be used for the incredible things that he has been used for because he had the courage to take the risk for God, risking everything, even his life, what are you willing to do? I want to challenge you this morning. Take a look at your life. Look at the ways in which you have been just okay being comfortable. Where do you need to take more risks for God? It might be in your relationship with others. It might be the way in which you choose to live your life. Maybe it's with your time or your money. Or maybe it's that first step of even just following Jesus. Whatever it is, don't be afraid of what might happen. We can risk, even in the face of the unknown, because our God is bigger than any of our circumstances. Our God is more powerful than any of the things that we could face in life. When we're willing to take the risk for him, he is going to answer our risk with a life of adventure, a life of fulfillment, a life of satisfaction, and a life that helps transform the world around us for him. A life dedicated to following his mission. We just need to be willing to take the risk into the unknown. We need to be willing to take the risk in following Jesus and following where he's gonna lead us. As we close the service today, let's stand together. We're gonna sing a new song for us in here in United, but this whole song is about how fear doesn't stand a chance in compared to the love of God. That God's love is greater and can give us the courage we need to be able to live a life in line with him. Let's sing this together.